can can somebody tell me can three people tell me one thing that you learned about how machine learning how machine learning works um from from the first two um Graxio monthlies that we did somebody have one fact about how machine learning <clears throat> works I think my main takeaway was that it's all functional yeah uh, that, that your inputs functionalize into your outputs yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to build this function and a function is essentially just this. It's a model that you can run to make a prediction and the prediction is usually probabilistic. It's it's either one number from zero to one or some group of numbers from zero to one usually that predict some type of output, right? And the thing about this function is that it's configurable. So it has these knobs and levers called parameters. And that's very good. So it's so the, the whole premise, keep this right, is, is about building a function. What else? What's another machine learning fact? Oh, Vanessa almost said something. I know it's well, it's it's self-deprecating. So I was <laughs> I was hesitating, but it was, it was uh, the fact was I needed a refresher on algebra. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. So there, there is a good amount of math in this, right? And what's really cool about machine learning as it's evolving is that most of the math, most of the difficult math is kind of baked into this thing called automatic differentiation, right? So Vanessa, will you play a game with me? Yes. This is a guess a number game. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play a guess a number name game with, um, let's see, we need three other people. And um, so pick one person to be on your team, Vanessa. Oh, let's see, let me pick a name. Um, oh, David. So David, <laughs> welcome to the panel. So, you, um, so David, your job is going to be to pick a number between, uh, between one and 10 inclusive, right? And don't tell us what it is. Okay. Um, and then, so now we have, and, and Vanessa is going to guess this number, right? Um, and David is going to say higher or lower, right? And now, um, so, so David, pick another person that's going to lead the next team. Uh, let's see, uh, Conrad. Conrad, okay, come on. So Conrad, your job is going to be, be to pick a number between one and 10 inclusive. Uh, Vanessa, pick a person. <laughs> Jason, it looks like you're someplace fabulous. So I'll pick Jason. Okay, so uh, so it looks like Jason and Conrad. So Jason, you're gonna guess. So um, so let's see, uh, Vanessa, were you the one picking the number and David right. was guessing, is that right? And so do you have your number? No, opposite, I'm, I have to guess his number. Okay, so um, guess David's number. And, and by the way, Conrad, are you wanna be the picker or the guesser? Uh, I would be the picker. Okay, great. And so, um, so Vanessa, guess your number. So I start with five. Okay, David, higher or lower? Lower. Okay. So, um, so Jason, you're guessing. So start with your number. Two. Two. And Conrad, higher or lower? Higher. Okay, so and really that's all we're going to do, but essentially you can see that what what we're doing is we took we took a couple of sets of data. We carved that data up and then we made guesses about what that what that data is right and based on this concept called automatic differentiation we're going to essentially look to see if the number that the um, that the system has picked is above or below the actual prediction based on the input training data, right? And it turns out that there are a couple of models for solving this problem, right? And if you have a bunch of numbers together, they're gonna to make a curve. Sometimes that curve is linear. Sometimes that curve is nonlinear, right? So an example of a nonlinear prediction might be we're, we have something that makes a normal distribution, right? Which, which has some type of a curve. And so we need more than an algebraic line, right? So what's going to happen is that this machine learning model 
is is going to effectively mix a bunch of a couple of layers together and it turns out that guess one number isn't really that interesting from a machine learning perspective but when you add more and more dimensions to this model it becomes interesting right so so for example if we had a four or five dimensional problem um, this might be like the guessing the sales price of a home based on some inputs and the inputs might be zip code they might be the square feet of the house they might be distance from employer they might be um, anything that's that's that can be categorized and has a numeric value right and you could look at every single one of them as a, a um, dimension right so and the way that this works is that is that the algebra that we use is called numeric algebra and it's based on a model called linear regression right which is is essentially a way of taking of taking a bunch of inputs and then fitting the best line in it right and you might suspect that linear regression is not a very good algorithm for predicting nonlinear outputs right so what you do is you take the outputs and you kind of build a whole bunch of smaller um, smaller line segments and then you kind of um, work them together and you use the rules of calculus to help make better and better predictions as you move across the curve okay so um so yes so there is algebra involved and there's actually matrix algebra involved right so it's it's um that's something a lot of us haven't had it turns out that way back in the day um my about half my degree was um was in math and i never thought that i would use it and this was all about linear algebra and system simulations and linear regressions and statistics it turns out that's another way to say one step of a machine learning process, right? So, so what we actually said is there's this model, right? And the model is a function with all these knobs and levers. And think of the knobs as like the slope of a line or maybe the bias of a line, right? So the slope is going to move this um, up, moves, move the angle of the line up or down, right? And the bias is going to move the whole line up or down. Does that make sense? So we have all these knobs and levers. More dimensions means more knobs and levers. And so that's one layer. And so we're going to, we're going to build multi-layer neural networks, right? And each layer is just one set, one linear regression. And then we're going to stick functions between them so that it looks like this giant pipe, right? And so we're going to start with a matrix. And then we're going to pipe it into the first layer. And then we're going to pipe it through this function called an activation function. And all we're going to do with an activation function, it's something with a curve in it or something that's nonlinear. And that's going to help our neural network make nonlinear predictions. Cool. So that's, that's the first part. Those are the layers in the model. So the second part is that we are going to take some real world observations and we're going to split those two ways, right? The first way is between test data, and that's a smaller section of data, and training data, right? So for example, I might have my all of my best machine learning data people scraping MLS for, for, their, uh, for the data, you know, get one subscription to MLS, probably highly illegal, right? So uh, get one subscription, you know, take all the data from it, get all the house prices, and then, um, and then, then, you know, arrange them randomly, pick off like 50 houses or so to serve as our test, and then pick off the rest of the data and say, hey, this is your training set. And the training set, and then, then we're going to split the data again, both the training and the test, between the data that you use to make the prediction, which are things like zip code and you know square feet, number of bathrooms, and, um, and then you know, on the other side, we have the price of the house, right? The thing that we're trying to predict. So we're actually going to use Axon and we're going to build a neural network and we're going to use it to make predictions. And the way that this is going to work is we're going to take our, um, we're going to take a problem and I'll let you pick between two problems. And then we're, we'll, we'll 
gather some real world data and we're going to cheat with real world world data, right? So we are going to essentially pick a well understood problem. And then we're going to use a function to create real world data. And then we're going to carve that up the two ways that we said, right? Um, the, the, the data and the predictions. And then the other way was test and, and, um, and training data, right? And then we're going to feed it into the algorithm. And the algorithm is going to essentially use the rules of calculus to adjust, to, to kind of look for, to guess a solution and adjust the solutions based on a function called a loss function, right? So a loss function, all it does, it says, hey, um, you, you guessed, so uh, Vanessa, your first guess was five, right? And so Vanessa might have missed the original prediction by three. And so, and then on the other end of the curve, the first guess was two, and maybe that missed the original prediction by five, right? And so if, so these, these numbers would be, you know, we, we'd have some type of a formula to give them, typically something that's nonlinear, and then we'd basically take the derivative and then we'd use the derivative to, um, to, do, to do some work. But luckily, we don't have to take the derivative. <laughs> the, um, the, the teams have done that. And, and it turns out if you can do that automatically at compile time, machine learning gets very, very fast because the, the majority of the most difficult math is actually solved for you. So you won't see us take any derivatives today. Um, if you wanna see that, uh, look at Jose's original demo of NX. And he actually uses the, the, um, the auto grad feature, the automatic gradient, the auto diff function to actually take derivatives and, and adjust the arguments based on those derivatives. But we're going to use a layer and a framework that's called Axon. Okay, so numerical elixir is an umbrella project, right? So this underneath it has a number of, of, different, of different libraries, right? And NX is itself as numerical elixir, it has, um, it has tensors, it has the, um, the linear algebra and certain statistical functions that are, that are helper functions. And it also has in it, there's something called Exla, which is a, um, which is a compiler that actually um, connects to TensorFlow and um, uses their acceleration um, framework for working with, with tensors. Okay, and, but these are some of the other, these are some of the, the projects that have sprung up. And it's funny, the last time I gave this talk, there were four, and now there's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's crazy, right? So we have the um, we have data sets that that have kind of um, composed and organized the right way for NX. We have NX itself, which is the multi-dimensional arrays and tensors. And inside NX, there's a couple of other pieces, right? So there's NX that we talked about. There's um, Xla, and then there's Torch X, which is bindings to some Python libraries that um, that can help this, this framework get, get kind of started and accelerated. I would imagine that most of those will be replaced with Elixir equivalents over time. Um, there's, there's two that are pretty new, right? There's, there's the, the Vega Lite, which, which is a graphics library, which is great for Livebook. And then there's Livebook itself, which is a, a library that's used for interactive exploration of numeric problems. And then there, I think this is Kino, which is um, interactive widgets for Livebook. And I haven't worked with them, but the idea is that you could take some inputs like a slider, and then based on the slider, you could change some charts that, that might be looking at inputs for a model or something like that. This is pretty cool. But the one that we're gonna look at is this one right here. It's called Axon. So we're actually not going to write Elixir code. We're actually going to work in IEX, right? Because that's what I'm more comfortable with. And, and um, I'd rather work with one concept at, at, at a time. And if you're all interested, we might do Lifebook or something like it for the next Graxio learning module, right? That might be a lot of fun and, and kind of look at some of the test cases out there. Lifebook is, is, was announced to help people present their findings for numerical um, projects, right? Research projects. 
but it turns out people are using it everywhere, right? So we're starting to see documentation show up here. And we're starting to see really cool individual use cases. How many of you, just a show of hands, have, have written, written some, some software for a NERVS project, even in Hobby? Wow, that's a nearly a quarter. That's pretty cool. So it turns out that when you combine NERVS with Livebook, you can do things like work with sensors by, by just kind of you know dropping into the um, dropping into the book, and then you can can quickly see what types of inputs are coming out of the sensors, and you can compare them against the specifications, and it really accelerates the development process. So I think that that's a really cool. Um, there's there's a really cool piece around that. So there are some notebooks that are created. Well, actually, there's just the one from Jose's demo. Of the um, of the numerical data set, so there are some handwritten letters, and there's a there's a demo, and building a machine learning library around that. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. But this is the notebook that he used, or the live book that he used, and so there's also a video that that shows him building this notebook over time. It's pretty cool. But let's jump into the lib directory and go into Axon, and let's look at some of the functions. So. Does anybody remember what an activation function does? It's the thing that goes between the layers, but what does it do? That's the thing that, that takes a guess at the uh, initial output right in the training. Close, close. What it actually does, it's the, it's the nonlinear piece, right? So this is uh, these would be like sigmoid functions and things like that. Like a there's a tan h function, but these have s shapes usually. And the reason that that's important is that we're using a linear regression model, and that only pre predicts straight lines, right? And so if you pipe together a bunch of straight lines, you get another straight line. And so by mixing activation functions in between, what's going to happen is that we're going to be able to make nonlinear predictions. And and both the problems that we're going to look at today. Um, or we're going to look at one of the two, they're going to make nonlinear predictions, right? And so, and layers, right? These are the, the, um, the things with a, with a slope, Wx plus b, right? The weight times the input plus b, right? That's, that's like the mx plus b that you learned in, in grade school algebra, or I guess junior high algebra, right? And then we talked about loss functions. There they are. There's metrics. Optimizers are techniques to um, make something converge, right? So this is this is how we take a training uh, training step, and then this is the piece of code that uses the auto differentiation to make the the um, the training to train the parameters to get to train the model to get a little bit better based on the training data, right? This is the code that extracts the knobs and levers, the parameters. This is the code that basically talks about, you know, in, in Elixir, we're usually, we're used to dealing with lists of lists, right? And with, with um, NX and Axon, we're dealing with tensors, right? So this is multi-dimensional outputs. And this shape data helps, helps essentially work with shapes as we're going through um, linear algebra um, manipulations, right? And then there's a training API that that combines all these these things together, right? It, it takes a um, it takes a loss function, it takes a optimizer, it takes a training input, it takes the um, the labels or the targets, and combines all those things together over a series of steps called epics. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so I want everybody to find your chat program, or your your chat button. And um, don't type an answer yet, but what I'd like you to do, I'm gonna have to stop sharing for a second, but what I'd like you to do is to type one word um, for two choices. Uh, the first choice is FizzBuzz, and that's gonna be the FizzBuzz game, right? The one where you count um, one, two, and you say Fizz if something is divisible by three, Four, and you say buzz if something is divisible by five, and then you say fizz buzz if something is divisible by, um, by 15, um, by three and five, right? Which means divisible by 15. So fizz buzz is one of the things that we can build. The second thing that we can build is something to recognize 
a logical operator, like an XOR gate, right? And both of these things are interesting because they're nonlinear prediction. Okay, so when I say three, you're either going to type FizzBuzz or XOR, and we're going to try to take real world data and then, and then build a prediction that um, based on their, that real world data that, um, that, that, that acts like, like that function, but without using the same rules, okay? Okay, so when I say three, you're going to type either FizzBuzz or XOR. One, two, three. Oh, somebody count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, XOR. Three FizzBuzz. I think XOR is the landslide winner. All right. So let's go ahead and get that started. So I'm going to share screens again. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, we can read this. Okay. So what I have is, is effectively a project. And the only thing that I've added to the project are these three dependencies, right? And remember, index is the one that we're going to rely on to do tensors and some of the operators with operations with tensors. There's XLA, which has the pre-compiler that's used in Google's TensorFlow. And that has the accelerators for, um, for working with matrices, um, working with tensors. And then there's Axon. And this is the layer that sits on top of both that provides the machine learning services. That's the one that we looked at with the parameters and the training and the optimizer and things like that. These are the things that Jose coded by hand in his initial um, demonstration with a handwriting recognition data set. Okay, so um, so what we're going to do, so I've already done the mixed depths get and I've already done the, the compilation. So what we're going to do is start the project in the context or the start IEX in the context of the project. Okay. And of course we're going to need Axon. And let's see, so we were going to do the XOR, right? Okay, so I think that what I'd like to do first is we need, so, so what do we need to do before we can make a prediction based on data? We need data. We need data, <laughs> right? It's pretty easy, right? You can't do, can't do anything without the data. And so what I'd like to do is create some data, but what are the rules for XOR? It's true it's if only one of the inputs is true. It's true if only one of the inputs is true, right? And so we could do this, right? Um, so what is it? Um, uh, what are the logical operators? What is the module? Does anybody know? Uh, let's see, true. And then we, information. So this is a data type reference modules, Adam. So it can't be in there, could it? Could it? How about kernel? Probably the kernel, yeah. <laughs> Not in the kernel either. Maybe oh, the, oh, I got it. Run. I got it. Uh, is bit Pitfall. dot x. Okay, so we can do bitwise. This is what we need anyway, right? So we need to combine. Um, so logical operators and XOR would use um, trues and falses. We're going to use ones and zeros. A zero is is false and and um, and a one is true, right? So if I do a bitwise of XOR, so what is zero, XOR, one? What's this going to be? True. True, which is one, right? So in one zero, that's also true. What about zero zero? False. False. And what about one one? It's also false, right? So the reason that this is interesting from a machine learning perspective, if this was just an or, this is a this is a linear problem, 
right? Because you could make a prediction zero, one, or two based on how many things adding, based on essentially adding them together. You could take your inputs, add them together, and and you could get a um, an interesting model that's that's linear and really easy. So XOR is a bit different because it basically starts at the bottom and starts to build and drops kind of on the corner. So if you if you imagine a surface, if you imagine a, a surface that's bent at the diagonal, that's what we have here in this model. It's nonlinear. So what I'd like to do first is um, is essentially build a training set. So let's see. We want a four. I taken from, um, what do we want? Uh, zero, one. I get my ranges and Julia and Elixir mixed up all the time. I mean, I'll, if I drop a colon in there, you can mock me relentlessly, right? So J is taken from um, zero, one. Then I'm ready to do, right? And so I know I want a tensor. So index.tensor. Right, and okay, so I'm gonna build a batch for every data set. Um, let's do it this way. So I'm gonna take the inputs like this, right? So essentially I'm going to make a bunch of little batches because that's the way that you would shape, that's the way you would shape a training problem, right? You don't, you, you don't train everything at once. You train it in a chunk of batches. And each batch is going to be the size of one XY um, coordinate, right? Or one IJ coordinate, right? So um, so when, when I do this, what we're going to get is a tensor. So one of the things that I could have done, I could have specified a data type here. But if I do, I'm going to get myself in trouble because I'm not, I'm not fluent enough to do a live demo with, with that kind of data. But essentially, I could save a lot of space here by going to an eight-bit, uh, an, an eight-bit tensor, right? So this is a two-dimensional tensor, or one-dimensional tensor with with two elements, and I have batches of those, right? And so that's that's my training data. So what about the test data? So the test is, how about something like? Um, Let's see. So the test day is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to take this whole thing and then I'm going to build a tensor out of it, right? And the reason is that this thing is going to be smaller because it's a set of test data, right? So don't have to worry about cutting it into batches. But so let's say for i is taken from zero to one. And then say uh, do, and then let's say, and then this is going to be I. Do we want to do zero or one here, just to take half of them? Doesn't matter. Somebody make a pick. Zero. Zero, right? So we're going to take half the data, and it's going to be, it's going to be if it's it's. We're essentially going to, going to build our test data that's half the size of the of the rest of the data set, right? And we're going to set this up as one batch, and we're going to be able to like run the prediction of all those at the same time of this whole batch at, at the same time, right? And so now all I have to do is start to work on the targets, right? Okay. Um, Let's see. So I think probably the way to do this is to is to think about the inputs. Um, let's take a look at these, right? Does it matter that the train the testing data is a subset of the training data? No, it should be. It should be. Essentially, we're going to test the test is a sanity check. Right, and of course, this could be the whole set. That's not the way I would structure a real mach machine learning problem, so I'm just not going to make it that way, right? right. So I'm going to say, give me i and j. I just want to get a look at what this, what the shape of the state is. So this is going zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. Okay, so this should be zero, 
one, one, zero, right? And so how do we build that? So this is targets. Let's see. So I want, um, let's just do it like that, right? And then um, essentially what I'm going to do I'm going to build a tensor out of that thing. And this is going to be a uh, Let's see if I get this right. I'm going to build a tensor out of that thing, I think. So the reason that I'm kind of um, struggling here is that there is a level of dimensionality one more than you think that you need because this is carved into batches. So I'm just going to have to try this and see if it works, right? And so I'm going to say this is going to be um, bitwise dot uh, b x or, and this is going to be i j, right? Let's see what this builds. Do tensor, oh index dot tensor, right? Okay, so I think that this looks good for me, right? So I have a batch that looks like this, a batch that looks like this. So as I run my batches, this is, this is what I expect the results to be. Okay, so this is a little bit weird, right? So one of the things that's weird is that we have multiple, a multiple dimensional problem here, right? So like you could think about this as instead of building building a prediction for one number, I'm getting a prediction for two numbers, right? The I and the J, right? And so you think of the I and the J, each pair of I and J as a feature, right? So maybe the first feature is the first input of I and J. Is where the first feature is I and the next feature is J. And then, you know, the, the result is gonna be the two added together. Okay, so I think that we have the data that we need. So we have the targets, we have the training, and we have the test. And so now, what do we need next? So we have the data. Now, what's the next step? Is there any, any guesses? The network. Build the neural network, right? So I'm going to have something that looks something like this. So the model, when you see the word model, I want you to imagine a function that is configurable with parameters, right? And this function is going to be based on a bunch of things that are piped together, right? So the first thing is gonna be that input layer, so all my inputs. And the next thing is going to be that first dense layer, right? The MX plus B. And then the next layer is going to be an activation function. And then we're going to have another dense layer and another activation function. And then, and then NX is going to figure out how to wire them all together. Cool? OK. So let's give this a try. So um, and I'm, I, I have a little bit of a cheat sheet that I'm working with. But we're already, we've long departed from the cheat sheet. So I'm really in trouble if, if the wheels start to fall off, but I think we're going to be okay. All right, so we're going to say, um, so we're going to start with what's the far left of, of what did we say we were going to start with? Inputs. Inputs, right? So if we start here, <clears throat> that guy right there, right? And the way to look at this input layer is we want to look at the dimensions of it, right? So this one is going to be the number or number uh, or batch size, maybe. And this one is going to be now. What I'd like to do, I don't want to lock down my batch size from my model, right? 
I want to be able to run as many batches as I have data, and I want that to be able to shift from time to time, right? So what I'm going to say is you figure it out, Axon, right? How many features do I have? Two. Two, right? What are they? The two numbers. Yeah, I and J, right? And then we're going to pipe that. What's the next layer? Does anybody remember? Activation function. Right before the activation function. The dense layer. Den that's right. Way to go. Who got that? It was me. Vanessa, excellent. And um, Keith, we're going to save the activation function for next because you're right about what's coming, right? And so um, we're going to pick eight. Why are we going to pick eight? Because that's what I'm feeling right now. Anybody think this should be a little bit more or less? This is going to. This is a hidden layer. It really doesn't affect anything besides how many overall, what the overall matrix size that I'm multiplying, right? So. Um, it's, it's like this, this is, we're expanding it out so that we get some variety in, in the neural network, right? And so then I'm going to, so we need an axon, we need a dense layer and the dense layer needs an activation function. And so activation and let's call this one 10 H, right? Why? Well, because I know a little bit about activation functions and, and there's a couple that I can use here. And there are strengths and weaknesses of each one. I will let you read about them. But essentially, both 10H and sigmoid are two activation functions that are S-shaped. And we're looking for an S-shape because essentially that's going to let us build a nonlinear data set, right? It, it, the way that it works is that the activation function lets the curve bend. And that's, that's what we're looking for. And so then we're, we want to pipe this thing to, um, can everybody still read that okay? Or do, you need, do I need to bump it a little? Yes, okay. Everybody's on those big development yeah. monitors, right? If you need more size, let me know. I think it'll help us to be able to get this on um, all on one layer, right? So we have a dense layer. Now we need, so, um, and, Keith, do you see your activation function here? That worked exactly like another layer, right? It's like we're piping into another function. The difference is that this side of the activation layer, the dense part, this is a function with configurable knobs and layers, right? This is just a raw function that knows how to handle matrix input. Effectively, what we're going to do is called tan H on every single function in, in the model or every, every single parameter that comes through. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to build another layer. It's another dense layer. And um, how, many, how many features are in our prediction? What shape do we want our prediction to be? Just one number. Just one number, right? It's, it's a, and, our one number is a probability, right? The probability is going to be, if it's closer to one, it's going to be true. If it's closer to zero, it's going to be false. That's it, right? So what we can do by evaluating the data, anything greater than, than 0.5 is, um, is, is um, true. <laughs> I was going to get there, <laughs> I promise. Okay, and so, we, um, so we're going to have one, output of this, and then we need an activation. And so the way that it works is that if you're looking for a single probability, then effectively what you want is, is a um, activation function called sigmoid. It, it effectively converts a single number to something that's probabilistic with a pretty um, convenient shape. And then there's another activation function that if we had a number of these, um, it could effectively build an activation function that um, the uh, if if I had a, a number of these uh, like like my input. Where's my input? Uh, let's see, like these, 
like zero one and one zero. So very often what I want to input is um, multiple, multiple elements in, in um, multiple classifications, right? So maybe I'm predicting a color and the colors, um, I might have a zero or, or zero to 2.25, that's a red, 0.25 to five, that's a blue and on and on and on, right? So the classification, um, what I would do is I would, I would change this activation function from sigmoid to soft max. But since there's only one class that I'm predicting, right? One, one probabilistic number, I'm gonna call this sigmoid. Okay, so that's my model. I think that's, oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. I already love Axon, right? Because it's telling us, so if you hold your set head sideways, this looks like a, a giant elixir pipe, right? We take our inputs, we pipe them into a dense layer, right? And then we have 24 knobs and levers, which is correct. And I know it's correct because we have, it's a two by eight array, right? Really eight by two, eight rows and two columns. And for each row, I have an extra one for the bias, right? Remember we have the slope, and to get the slope, I need uh, two times eight, which is 16, plus eight again for the bias, which is 24, right? And how many knobs and levers are in the activation layer? Zero, right? It's just, it's just the, the function. It's, we, get, we get tangent, right? And tangent is gonna be tangent no matter how hard we try to, to do, um, no matter what we do to it, right? And then there's another dense layer. And so if I follow the same formula, eight times one plus one, I get nine parameters. So this whole model has how many parameters? How many knobs and levers? 33. Yeah, yeah, 33, that's it. So basically you can see how quickly these things get complex, right? And what we're going to do now is we're going to say, hey, give me a set of parameters Right, give me the, and then some metadata, and I'm not sure exactly what the metadata is. And then I'm gonna say the model. And then I'm gonna train it, right? So what's a training step? So the training step is just one iteration that takes all of my batches and applies that, um, that auto differentiation technique to, to make things a little bit better, right? I try to improve things a little bit at a time and I take a small segments. So remember we said we we're gonna build, rather than building one large segment and adjusting that, we we're gonna build a lot of small segments and, and work towards the solution. Well, that's what's happening here, right? And so, um, so we're going to use binary cross entropy. So binary cross entropy, this is just a kind of loss function, right? This um, and this particular loss function works well when you're working with multi-dimensional input. It's, it's essentially the most basic multi-dimensional um, you know, we're, we're going from multiple classes to one class, but um, so this is, this is um, an excellent loss function to use. And then, um, then I need an optimizer. Optimizers dot, and we're gonna use the, um, how about the standard? Yeah, okay. So I, I, so these are the optimizers that are available to me. And really the most basic one that you learn in your, um, your machine learning one class, 101 class is standard gradient descent. And that's exactly the one that Jose implemented by hand in his talk, right? Um, all it is is, um, is taking derivatives and then um, going in the direction of the result. Just, just one, one small step and doing that over and over, right? And so, um, so now I've got my, um, my optimizer. And so how big of a step do I wanna take? 
I don't know that, <laughs> I guess. And so this closes this parenthesis. Now I need to close this one and then I need to pipe that thing. Okay, so I have a training step, which is based on my model. And now I need to tell it to train. So I should say axon Uh -huh, beautiful. <laughs> I love it when completion works the way you expect it to, right? And what's train? It's the original data set. Yeah, that training data set is the, um, and that's, that's, we know it's zero, zero, um, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, right? It's multidimensional. And then I also need the targets. What's the targets? Zero, one, one, zero. Yep, the, the predictions that I wanted to make, that each each set of inputs want, that I want to make, right? And so we also need to know how many steps, right? So let's run it for maybe a thousand. Let's see what that does. Oh, so I said I might get in trouble here, right? So let's go back here and see the targets, right? Okay, I said that I might need another layer than I expected to. Let's see if that's the case. Oh, and uh, help me out, somebody. Let's see. The tensor function needs to be an X tensor. Oh, uh, thank you. Next dot tensor. Okay, now let's try this. Oh, <laughs> I have never been so happy to see the training kind of work. Okay, so what's happening here is as we go through, it's running the each each one of what are the four batches in each set? It's the pair of numbers. Yeah, yeah, zero one or zero 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 one one zero one one, right? And then this is the average loss, and you can see that every single step it goes down a little bit, right? So like if I, for example, if I was to run more epics, and this is about where we, we landed at, landed before. So we landed at um, 0.18 and now my loss is much lower, right? And you could see, and now we can make predictions on this. So now we have, what do we collect? What did we return? We don't know what that second one is. We ignored it. But what's this first one? It's the knobs for the, the model. The knobs and levers, right? So these are the slopes and the biases for each dimension of my input, for each layer, right? So the first layer had knobs and layers that was like a, a 16, um, you know, 16 biases and it had, um, no, I'm sorry, 16 weights and it had eight biases. And the next layer had eight weights and one bias. bias. And, and if you want to check out the, the math behind why, how this matrix algebra works, check out the Grazio lesson um, in Julia. It's really, really um, good, right? It, it helps you dive down, down this path, right? But what we have now is knobs and levers. And what can we do with the knobs and levers? Adjust them. Yeah, so they've been, yeah, we can adjust them more, right? With more training. And we can also, also use them to make predictions, right? Now we have this, so Vanessa, we have this beautiful model that we've trained, right? So Elixir played guess a number, like a, a a thousand iterations of that with, with all four batches in our set, right? It played guess a number. And it used calculus to always guess a little bit better in the right direction and always in the right proportions. That's what we did. And so for each, each iteration, each epic, the loss went down, right? So now what we can do is we could say axon, 
Okay, and so we want what would what would your guess be for the first thing that we pass in here? The two, well, the three arguments. What do you think that we need? Don't worry about the order. What would you guess that you needed to make a prediction? Anybody? The model. The model. The model. Uh, parameters. And the inputs. Inputs and do we have inputs? Yep, what are the, the inputs that we're going to use for the test? Test, right? Yeah. Ah, look at that. So we got, so what is this? Is that true or false? Basically false. False. And what's that? True. True. Okay. So let's see. Test is zero, zero and one, zero. False, true. So that's cool, right? Now, not every problem has the basic shape of this neural network that we just used, right? So there's, there's a couple of problems with the dense layer, right? The first problem is that we can run out of gas relatively quickly as we add more and more inputs, right? So a good example is I'm looking at an image right now. And if you look at, if, if you hold an iPhone up and take a picture, it can draw boxes around the individual faces. That's machine learning. It's not done with a dense layer. I can promise that. There are too many ones and zeros to make an accurate prediction to recognize a face. So what's done is something called a convolutional network, right? What you do is there are scanners that take every, every, um, I don't know, every, maybe there's eight blocks across and, and um, 16 blocks down or something like that in a standard image. And you'll look for individual shapes like vertical lines, horizontal lines, wavy lines. And modern convolutional networks even know how to pick their own features that are important, right? And so what you do is you, you play this game of the scanner and then you combine the inputs with some type of, of pooling layer, right? And maybe what you're doing, if you're looking for black and white, you take maximums or minimums, right? Maybe if you're looking for grayscale, you just take an average. So you can play games to make, like to add a lot of contrast, right? And um, if you're, if you're, playing games by looking for an average, you can take the resolution down by just taking an average. And so in that way, you could turn like a bunch of, like a really dense image and boil it down into something that's a, a lot more manageable, right? And it says, hey, what I need is for you to find these features. If it has, if it has two vertical lines and, and um, like, 10 or more horizontal lines, it's a ladder, right? If it's something you want to strangle, maybe it's a cat. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry about that. <clears throat> Dog person here. But basically, that's, that's the way a convolutional network works, right? Now, the other thing that I can do is sometimes, so what if I, what if I made this prediction again? What outputs am I going to get? Similar. Identical. So the problem with this, if you're doing next word analysis, this doesn't work, right? So that, that next letter analysis that you have on your iPhone that says, hey, so I can write, I mean, I'm going to be obsolete as a writer in three years because someone's going to say ecto for their first word and then they're going to write a whole book with that thing. They're, they're surprisingly good, right? <laughs> surprisingly accurate. And they're going, to, they're going to throw all the excellent documentation for ecto um, and that in, in a hopper and then they're going to build predictions from it. But the way that this works is with something called an RNN or, or a recurrent neural network or some of the families of neural networks underneath RNNs, right? And what you do is you feed the output of the neural network back into the input. And there are ways to do that in a way 
that make it more efficient, right? So what happens is that you can imagine that the math gets a little bit fuzzy as you start, um, as you as you get too far from the first prediction, right? It turns out that that everything starts to look the same to the neural network um, after you after you pass through a couple like nine or ten words as you increase the depth. So there are ways that you can that you can make, for example, the neural network forget words like a, an, and the, and things like that, right? They can recognize data that's important and that's not important. And so there's a family of networks to solve those problems as well. But what we have here with Elixir is a first cut of the most important part of a neural network, right? So we didn't even have table stakes before, right? We didn't have this numerical Elixir thing. We couldn't represent numbers and tensors in an efficient way. Right, and tensors multi-dimensional output you see is everywhere here. You can't build a neural network with a linked list because it's just the it's it's all the permutations are going to get away from you, and all of the um, manipulation of the the data structures is going to get away from you. So, you know, index has table stakes, and then Axon is essentially starting to use these and the beautiful abstractions that we have in Elixir to um, to layer these concepts one after another, and and it this this project is moving at breakneck speed, right? Because the math is well understood. There are papers and papers on this stuff, and um, and the nice thing about Elixir is it's not as close to the math as Julia. But it's pretty close to the map, right? It's it's a functional language, and we're dealing with functions here. <laughs>